Welcome to Look, Listen, Laugh. Now, my guest this episode, I'm really excited to chat with. He's an award-winning writer, director. He's a Logie award-winning actor. He stars in the latest Netflix smash, Boy Swallows Universe. And I gotta say, whenever I catch up with this guy, I'm, I'm always just left with uh, a real admiration for his joy and uh, he's got a real spark to him. And I, I think you're gonna enjoy this conversation with Rob Carlton. You know how they usually begin podcasts like where they just start talking like this. Mm. You know, this could be the beginning of the podcast. It feels like the beginning to me. <laughs> and as you go through a day, uh, I think it's incumbent upon not just artists and creative storytellers, but everybody, every walk of life to search for possible beginnings. Yes. So we could have just discovered one right now. I think we did a natural one. <laughs> Good to see you, Rob. Man, lovely to see yeah, you, buddy. Totally. Warm welcome to the Central Coast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me into your house to do this. It's uh, that's great. It's, it's always a good insight when you come into someone's house and you see the books that they're reading. Ah, oh, that's a good one. I like mm, that one, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, or you see like, uh, well, in the old days when we had records and uh, movies and stuff. Yeah, you that's know, right. See, you know, it's always a good sort of uh, insight into someone's life and being sort of welcome into their home. And that's why now it's important to really get to know someone, to uh, jump onto their streamers uh, and have a look at their search history uh, and the shows they've been watching, <laughs> yeah. um, which is, I guess... Something you'll have to watch out for, should I visit your house? Yes. Wonder, yeah, like, why is he hacking my computer? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, I'm just trying to get to know you, Joel. Yeah, relax, man, relax. Just, it'd be easy. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Come yeah. on, be, be, a, be a welcoming host. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, the algorithm seems to be prompting farmer wants a wife here, Joel. What are you watching, son? <laughs> yeah, right. Dark web. Hang on, I never... <laughs> so so you've, been, um, you've been working a lot of late in terms of, you know, putting, putting out, you know, different projects that you've been working on with TV and, yeah, that's and film, right. but live, that's what I'm interested in, okay. live. Yeah, yeah, right. Because, you know, it's, it's interesting, like you, because you're known for acting mm. and being seen on stage and screen, but with, there's not a lot of actors that make that jump into stand-up, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's something that's really admirable because it's oh, a geez. big, yeah, it's a big, it's a big leap, you know, mm. so many actors that I've spoken to that talk about, oh man, I would love to give that a shot, but yeah, it's just too, too confronting, you mm. know, but you're, you're the sort of personality that'll just, yeah, yeah, let's give it a whirl, let's do it. Yeah, definitely, uh, and it is very different, and, and it's actually important because you've got a learned, um, you know, audience, people that follow mm -hmm. you, you understand the various differences of comedy, so right now, the show that I've put together, I've got my first solo show ever coming up. It's called Willing Participant. It's a 60-minute solo show, mm -hmm. right? Now, that, as you know, is slightly different to stand-up comedy. Yes. So this is a theatre-style storytelling show that looks for all the world like it could be stand-up, but it's fully scripted, as a lot of stand-up is. Sure. But it's just the, uh, the sentence structure, the paragraph structure, the word formulation is different. Mm -hmm. So I tell four true stories over the course of an hour, and each story is about 13 minutes long. Um, and because it's storytelling... There's a little bit more uh, theatrical devices with regards to movement, choreography, blocking, uh, prop work, uh, and how I'm building a, a story, uh, I guess, uh, generating drama and structure, mm -hmm. and then releasing it at different times. Mm -hmm. Stand-up comedy has a much more conversational feel. It feels to the audience like this is the first time the, the stand-ups had that chat. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have that going in. You know, this is a clear artifice, my show. It's clear I've... I've I've got the story, I've got the structure. What it offers an audience in that space is, you can relax, I've mm. got this, mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you a story, I'm gonna take you through all these different emotions. Now what my structure has going for it is that it allows me to build drama in mm. a much more mm. cohesive fashion. It allows me to uh, bring different um, emotions and, and stronger emotional beats that I can work on and, and then undercut um, because a trust builds up between storyteller and audience. And that mm -hmm. doesn't mean to say that I'm not there with surprises and surprising the audience with regards to where the narrative goes. But I think one of the great tools of trade of great stand-up comics is that sense of, yeah, trust me, but fucking I'm an unreliable guy to trust, <laughs> right? And it's much yeah. more punchy yes. and a little bit more bang, bang, bang. Yeah, yeah, and it, keep, and it keeps the audience on their toes too, That's also, right. as opposed to just getting relaxed into a monologue or a... That's yeah. exactly right. And so that's why I really admire uh, great stand-ups is because it is entirely, they know where they're going, they know what they're doing, but they have to keep it 
alive and quintessentially kind of in the moment mm -hmm. so that that audience has no idea which way that comic's going to go. Yeah. And they can, and, you know, and then if they get heckling, they can do that. They can be alive to it. Mm -hmm. So with regards to that challenge, I've got my solo show going on. But because I'm going to be out and about at festivals, I'm going to be meeting all the bright young things, I'm going to want to spend more time meeting all the great young comics and the great storytellers, I've decided to step into that stand-up comedy world as well. Mm -hmm. So this is something you can teach me uh, over the course of this chat, is figuring out, uh, even when I get up and do sort of shorter bits, I still fall into storytelling. Mm. I still go into that space. And, sure. and so what I come off stage thinking is, man, I've got to write more jokes. I've got to get more jokes in there, more observations, more little zippy one-liners, mm. more zingers. But there's also something to be said for the storytelling vibe that I can bring. So I have a feeling if I can really own that stand-up space, it'll be in the form of a melding of my storytelling style with hopefully some of the skills that guys like you have got. Sure. <laughs> but see, that's great, though, that you're bringing it from both ends, like from having the acting background, but also, you know, you've done lots of stand-up over the years, so having that background, mm. bringing those two together is a unique thing. Like, mm. sometimes you, you see e either one or the other. Like, I've seen a lot of one-person shows where great acting, but it's that edge that you're talking about, it, it, it doesn't have that dynamic to yeah. it. Whereas someone like, I remember years ago, um, seeing Billy Crystal's 700 Sundays, one man right. show, and him having a acting and a stand-up background, bringing those two together, it just makes it, like you said before, in the moment. It, mm. feel, it feels more in the moment as opposed to a recited piece. That's it. And you know that's what that's what I, like, I'm really looking forward to seeing your show. I, I like because you're going to be you're going to be in Adelaide. I'm gonna, that's right. I'm going to. I don't know where. I, some because my wife's going to be performing in Adelaide too. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go in. I got like a gap of a week. So hopefully I can make it work to come in and see that. Ah, uh, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers and crossed. and then you were in, then you were doing it in Sydney, and then the COVID hit. Uh, oh look, this has had a funny old history. This show and the, the way it came up. It jumped into my lap in a funny way. There was an extraordinary woman called Sandy McNaughton who was passionate about farmers' mental health. Mm. This is before, um, just before the pandemic. Right. Uh, and the extraordinary Damien Callanan, who's yeah, the master, yeah. of course, of touring and creating yeah. his own shows and just the most wonderful comedic uh, performer. Yeah, he's a great uh, guy. Yeah. He knew Sandy. Sandy knew he was the funniest thing on two legs rolling around and can handle that regional tour vibe. Um, and you'll enjoy this. So... Years ago, they realised that the mental health situation out in the bush was terrible. Mm -hmm. And so, to their credit, the state government decided to put some money to address that issue. Uh, and so, they put it together a program called Suicide Awareness. And they went uh, out to the regions and tried to convince farmers to come along to suicide awareness workshops. Um, they had no one sign up hmm. because at the end of the day, uh, who wants to sign up to a suicide awareness workshop? That's what it was called. Right. And uh, in a small community, it's like... And who wants to... Uh, yeah, it, it's very I'm, confrontational, yeah. Oh, the whole thing was, yeah. it was uh, wonderfully intended, mm. um, poorly executed. Mm -hmm. Sandy was a little brighter than that and thought, well, that's not what we need. What, what our farmers that are doing it tough, and this is in the lead up, this is through the drought years, mm -hmm. um, was they need a laugh. So her idea was... Let's um, put on a show. She first uh, invited Cal. Uh, what a relief, it's Damien Callanan. Mm. Cal goes out, puts on his show, but that's the honeypot. Uh, and travelling with, with us were mental health nurses, financial uh, advisor people and things like that. And so when we were there, they knew that, that was all, all those people were there. And they'd say, hey, look, if you're, um, if you, if you're here, why not? Chance to get a free uh, blood pressure check. Mm. And so over there, quick blood pressure check. And while you're over there getting your blood pressure, she was a mental health nurse and she just leaned forward and said, hey, how are you travelling? Mm. Uh, and so that's why mm. we got people to come to see the show. We gave them a laugh. Yeah. If they wanted to take it further, they could. Mm -hmm. Terrific idea. And so Sandy invited me out and she said, look, I've got this thing, but Cal can only do three weeks. And I'd done some charity work with uh, her and some filmmaking people up there in the north of the state. And she said, look, Rob, come on out. And I said, well, you under what are you talking about? I, I, I don't have a show. And she said, oh, but you're lovely and you're funny. Just come on out here. Tell them whatever you want. Uh, and they'll love it. <laughs> and I said, yeah, look, that's a lovely and generous yeah, observation. I appreciate it. <laughs> but it's a little bit more 
to it than that, right. you know, if you're a respecting audience. Yes. <laughs> um, and then I had to think about it, and I realized that over the course of the sort of X number of years leading up to that, Story Club that had been set up in Sydney at the performance space by Ben Jenkins and Zoe Norton Lodge um, it was this wonderful night in Sydney where people just got together and told true stories. Mm. It had to be written down, but they were true stories. Now, I'd written five or six of them for Story Club over the years. And I had to think and I thought I could take four of those, put them back to back, and that's a one-hour show. Mm. I knew the stories worked because I'd already done them live in front of audiences mm -hmm. and they killed when mm -hmm. I was just sitting there reading them. So I thought if I can uh, animate these, get myself up out of a chair, move around, get great direction, mm. then it might look like we've got a story. So I got the great Darren Gilshanen to come oh, and yeah, direct yeah. me, um, who's you know an absolute master, um, beautiful gentleman, and able to you know draw out and and ex you know, accentuate the comedy in the piece as well as the drama. Um, how did you find that process, having the direct, having someone, because for acting you've done that, but for like mm. live sort of storytelling stand-up, yeah. like it's usually directors aren't involved. Do you find that it brought a lot more out of the, yeah. out of the story? Yeah, than... yeah. And at the risk of getting um, smashed by people inside your industry, uh, it's the one area I've found stand-up comedy to be really lazy, mm. lazy mm. over the years. Yeah. Uh, I've been watching it for years. Um, people are reticent to invite directors in. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard a whole haste of reasons why they don't want to work with directors. I believe none of it. Mm. I don't. I don't think it helps yeah. not having a director. Yeah. Um, I Especially understand. with a narrative to to a piece as yeah, well. Yeah, but know. even you know, I personally would like to see more stand ups welcoming other stand ups to their shows and welcoming notes. Yeah. Welcoming oh, notes. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. What do you but, think on that? Because... Uh, do you, totally. Like, there's people that I... Try, you know, like our good friend Akmal. Mm -hmm. Akmal's got a great eye for this kind of stuff. Like, like he's... Um, yeah, he's just got... You know, it, as Anthony Murr always said, you know, like, him and Gary Eck would be working on something. You know, just trying to crack it and Akmal would come up. What do you do? Yeah, and, and Akmal would say, what about this, this and this? And that, that's it. You know? Mm -hmm. he, mm -hmm. uh, and he's got... and Because Akmal, he, he's very... Um, I know he, he seems very loose on stage and it's all kind of, you know, but his eye for, you know, great feedback and comments is, I've always found. To oh, be, mate, to I agree. On. And I think we can both agree uh, that those people that don't know Akmal um, would have no idea of the depth of thought that mm -hmm. is racing around in that beautiful Egyptian <laughs> head of his. Yeah. You know, it's extraordinary. I mean, obviously, all of his interests. Um, you know, in history and psychology, sociology, you know, cultural evolution, mm. uh, religious evolution. Mm -hmm. um, he's a beauty to sit down and talk to right. with all of those things. But you're absolutely right. His radar on comedy is terrific. Yeah. But I've been, yeah, you say it's just a little thing of mine is that I understand that it hurts to get notes and it f makes you feel funky. And stand up comedy is the last bastion of putting yourself out there and really making yourself vulnerable, I think, right. more so than acting. Right. Because there's so much more of a high wire act, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more random. Um, uh, things that can happen in so the many variables act. that come in to make it work or not work. or not work. Yeah. So I get that there's a tender a tenderness in that space, but I'd urge more comics to get more feedback, and I think their work can get better. Sure, sure. So to that end, to answer your initial question, um, yeah, my show would be much poorer without Darren Gilshin, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the end of it. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> but it's great that you can put your trust in someone like that too, mm, to know mm. I'm in good hands and they're going to be able to direct what I'm... What yeah, I'm and look, it's a really interesting thing because let's not gloss over the, you know, you say get a director, but, you know, if we want to, you know, have this podcast do anything for anyone, you've got to sit, the, lean in and remember the moments where it was difficult. Mm. So there were a couple of moments where, I mean, Darren is a strong-willed man mm -hmm. uh, and I got him in for that. Mm -hmm. Um there were elements about that notion. And then, you know, he's got to be brave in terms of coming in to direct me because mm -hmm. I'm the producer of it. You mm. know, I've got this producing background. <laughs> You're like, I could fire you. Yeah, well, that's exactly <laughs> right. Uh, I've, I've hired him to do a job. Mm -hmm. uh, now, happily, we know each other so well and we've worked together so many times on so many projects right. that that power imbalance was, was neither here nor there. Right. But the, the other thing was is that he was directing me from a theatre background mm -hmm. um, 
but as you know, my expertise is the live room because I host, as well as having a background in, in you know, stand up mm -hmm. and debating and comedy and improv, and I host events. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so my skill set there is very much how do I make this audience as comfortable as I can while getting them into a space that's potentially uncomfortable so that they can absorb as much information as we're trying to get into their bodies. Mm -hmm. So I do have an expertise around audience expectations mm. and figuring out what their expectations are, managing them in the lead up to it, and then on the day being able to be flexible in my mind and mm. spirit to make sure that they have a great, and that they're in a great space to accept my show. Mm -hmm. So Darren, and, and so, okay, the reason I mentioned that is so the, the, there's, because that's a skill set I know, mm. I, there's a vanity that comes to that within me, right? right. Darren says, well, I'm the director, Rob. You, the strongest beginning to this show is you doing this. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, if your assumptions hold true, you might be right. But I also know that farmers are coming into a thing. That first show we did, that wasn't ticketed in terms of they haven't paid to be there. Right. So what is an unpaying audience? With no invested interest. Right. So I'm aware of that. Mm. And there's, I got a couple of notes from Darren, to my eye, presupposed an audience that had paid to be there because he comes from a theatre background. Mm -hmm. I think that affected the opening of the show. Of course. Like right? any gig that you turn up to where it's a free gig where there's no in investment from the, from the audience, chalk and cheese. Right. You know? So I've got that knowledge and I didn't think Darren had that knowledge, but he certainly had a great idea for a strong opener. Right. I've then got to go through a period where I'm being directed to go, okay, I'm going to drop where I'm at and I'm just going to trust him and go there. Mm -hmm. It felt really difficult. Mm, and there mm. was a moment in those first week, that first week of rehearsal where he was going hard on one line, I was kind of digging my heels in here. Mm. And then you've got a personal friendship mm -hmm. on the line with two headstrong creatives coming at each other and it was uncomfortable. Mm. So I just mentioned that for listeners to go, you know, I, I just hear so often, you know, I want to be taken out of my comfort zone. I want to do this and I want to do that. And then you take someone out of their comfort zone and they're like, fucking get me out of here. You're <laughs> a fuckwit. Yeah, yeah. Because the difference between intellectually saying, I want to be taken out of my comfort zone. And actually. And actually doing it. Mm. Intellectually, we think, oh, yeah, that's going to be all right. And I know it's going to happen. But once you're in that discomfort space, mm -hmm. then your emotions take over. Mm -hmm. And to my and for my experience, as soon as you're uncomfortable and your emotions take over, it starts hitting at a different angle. Mm -hmm. My subconscious will start telling me that my greatest friend and mentor and one of the smartest performers I know in the world is in, is a fucking idiot. Yeah, he's sabotaging me. Fucking not yeah. just a fucking idiot. Oh, right. You don't you don't fucking know the shit, mate. Right, right. That's emotions. Yes. That's fear yeah. hijacking all your senses yeah. to say shut it, shut him down. Yeah. Because he's challenging you mm, and he's asking mm. me to make a change and I don't want to make a change because I'm a creature of habit. Mm -hmm. So my subconscious is going to jump up, shut that shit down, call him a fucking idiot so I don't have to listen. Yeah. So anyway, I just offer all but of that do, up. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you consciously, is that in the back of your mind as you're going through or is it through reflection that you come to that realisation? Uh, no, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So these days, right there and then, I know now. Right. So as soon as my body starts reacting that way, mm -hmm. I breathe and mm. stop and don't react on it. Mm. Easiest way to articulate it is this. If your emotional response isn't commensurate to the situation you are in, mm. now is not your time to talk. Right. Yeah, that's smart. Right? It is not your time to talk. Something else is going on in your body. You're under assault. Mm. Your emotions are coming up and you're in your fight or flight state. Now that, it might get you out of a pickle if you're gonna die, but outside of keeping you alive from an actual imminent threat, mm. it's probably gonna make things unhelpful mm -hmm. in a creative space. Mm -hmm. So what you wanna do, and what by I mean, your emotional response not being commensurate to the situation you are in, exactly the answer I gave before. I've got a friend and mentor giving me some advice, my brain is saying, this guy's a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. That's not right. That's not appropriate. It's not helpful. Mm -hmm. 
so what I've taught myself to do now is in the moment, go, whoa, breathe, breathe, and ask more questions. Mm, mm. Because only then will you find out why they're getting under your skin. Right. Because what's happening is they're attacking some weakness in your game your subconscious is trying mm -hmm. to protect you from. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so these... Before I learn all of these things, I just used to get into a dirty great argument and you shout at <laughs> people and go, you're a fucking idiot and have to reflect on that later. <laughs> <laughs> but these days, so that particular uh, example I gave in that, or, uh, in that rehearsal space with Darren was wonderful because, you know, he went away um, and thought about what was going on. Mm -hmm. I went away and thought about what was going on. And we both arrived the next morning and before we did anything, he was straight on it. Mm -hmm. We hadn't mentioned it the day before. It was just something we were both carrying. Mm -hmm. He, because he's a practitioner, he knows what this stuff's about. Mm -hmm. First words out of his mouth on arrival. Hey, Robbie, I was thinking about yesterday. Boom, boom, boom. And I said, oh, it's lovely of you to say, mate. I was thinking about yesterday too. Boom, boom, boom. Neither of us were quite right the day before. Mm. But because we were able to share our insights in a sober, generous, genuine fashion, um, the best thing happened when two bright people with good intentions are slightly at odds. That position's not right, that position's not right, but we found a third position outside the two of us which was better than better. what we had. Great. And then, you know, that might not be the last stop on that journey. We might find better and better and better. Right. But that to me is, one, is a great example of a good director and a good um, a performer getting the best out of each other. Sure. Now you say you came to that realization at this point mm. in your life. You you've got like decades and decades of working with directors. Mm -hmm. Had you ever had those similar experiences on set, like in a film or TV, where you've had that confrontation? But you're like, I gotta I gotta check myself here, or or because it's you're not necessarily friends. You're on a film set. You mm. can't be blowing up, or you know, yeah. you got to bottle oh, that. Oh, and... so look, it's interesting, isn't it? So I never really blow up. I don't shout or scream or things like that. That's that inner monologue. Right. And that normally happens too, by the way, if I'm in control. Right, okay. So that's a really interesting okay. thing. So yeah, in that situation, yeah. right, I was the producer. Yeah. I'd hired you've, Darren you've to come in and it, do it, that. Your I, I wrote it, I'm acting, yes. I'm producer. Okay. The other times that occurred was with Shandon Pictures. I was just going to say. <laughs> so the TV show, as yeah. you know, we raised a few million dollars. We made 16 shows. And that mm -hmm. was a classic. And I was showrunner in the true sense of the word. Sure. I wrote it. Mm -hmm. I directed it, I was mm -hmm. the lead in it, and then over and above all of that, I owned the production company that got all the investment, right. and I was employing everyone. Right. Right? So that whole thing was going on. And so, that's a lot of hats to be wearing. It too. is a lot of hats to be wearing. And Especially it was, when you're the lead in it. You yeah. know, that's, uh, you oh, it was the first big lift I'd done. Prior to that, the most money I'd raised was 12 and a half grand for a play that I'd written right. you know, a, a decade earlier. Sure. So this was a big lift. Um, you know, a lot of money, a lot of uh, pressure. And again, when I was in control of that, again, that's where I started learning that stuff. So again, I had two beautiful friends of mine. Hey, you remember Russell Smythe? Rusty Smythe. Oh, I know the name. Yeah, because he did, he did, he did uh, stand-up comic back in the day, just yeah. for about five, ten years. Right, he, was a, right. he was an advertising guy. Anyway, Rusty's a few years older than me, and I got him involved in stand-up when I was 21, and he right. was a bit older. He came in, hit it, was brilliant for a number of years, and then ducked out. Right. Anyway, I got him to come and help me uh, develop Shandon with a, my other great mate, Alex Weinerus, who co-directed it with me. Those right. two boys helped me develop the scripts, but I wrote all the scripts, and, and then we got together and brainstormed. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned it, because I invited them in. They were both wonderful men, super kind, super generous. They'd read my scripts, and as soon as they started saying, Laura, that's not funny, that's not this, that's not fun," And I'm like, my monologue would start. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not funny. Really? Mm -hmm. what, what do you, you know? know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. And again, I'd start thinking, you're an idiot. Shut up. Get out of here. Mm. And I learned, right, that's not fair. Mm. They're not idiots. They might not have solved it yet, but they're certainly pointing me towards problems. Mm -hmm. And that's gold, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I found if I'm in control of something, that's when the real gremlins start mm, and mm. I've got to watch out for them. Mm. And, and by and large, I keep them in check. You know, I'm not known for flying off the handle. I'm right. not a nasty guy on set. I, like, I, think, I think the most important thing, well, one of the most important things when you're collaborating with so many people um, is joy. Mm -hmm. 
right? I think joy is regenerative. Uh, joy people want to replicate, and people want to turn up again the next day. Yeah. So that's a real big focus for me. When I'm an actor and I'm an employee, I've got a slightly different take on it, which is I believe my role as an actor or a performer is to give the director options, mm. right? I'll come in with a position and I'll go hard on my position, right? Mm -hmm. I believe I am the expert in my character. Mm. No one knows my character better than me. Mm -hmm. I'm the expert. But the character's not the script. It's not everyone else's role. It's not the whole story. And the actor's not the director. So while I'm an expert in my character, experts have to know the ramifications of their role on everyone around them. Mm. If you don't know that, you're not an expert. Mm. Right? Mm. Um, so I'll go in to a director and I'll go, what about this? 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 If I can get one out of 10 whatabouts in, mm -hmm. I'm fucking <laughs> like this. Because yeah. the director's job is to go, yeah, nah, yeah, nah, yeah, nah, yeah. Right. right. And a good director will say no in such a way that you want to keep offering. Right. 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 And so to that end, if, if I'm inside a structure looking up, I know what my role is. Just keep getting up, keep turning up, keep offering up insights that are character relevant, that are script relevant, mm -hmm. that are drama relevant, whatever that is. Um, and to recognize that there's a lot of other stuff going on story-wise, script-wise, that's outside your remit mm -hmm. and sometimes you've got to bend the knee. Right, and, right. And no and that's, to, yeah. that's fine. And I'll go and go and go. And of course, there's times, and what, what people have got to understand with regards to that creative process is that there's different times for different conversations. Right. You can be having much more wide-ranging, open-ended what-if questions during pre-production. Mm-hmm. You can't be doing that no, when you've you got a fucking no. crew of 50, yeah. the lights are on and it's costing $10,000 a minute, right? right? Now is the time to put up and shut up. Mm -hmm. And if you're still arguing with the director, well, that's all fine, but you won't get hired again because it's sure. costing too much. Sure. The time for that conversation was yesterday. Yeah, it was way before. Yeah. And did you learn this by observation or did, did you have formal training that, you know, kind of put you in that mindset before, you know? No, there's, again, there's very little formal training. Um, I think in our world, um, for these sorts of things, you know, you've got, you, if you're an actor, you can do all sorts of training. Um, and as a script writer, you've got, you know, all, you, all of those things and a director, there's cameras and things like that, but there's very little formal training around what happens when all the different parts of the creative process come together. Mm. And that's why things fucking explode mm -hmm. so much is because mm. there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of um, pressure, obviously, financial and heading deadlines and all of that. But by and large, the whole thing is fueled by a creative anxiety. Mm. And the simple, prem the simple question, is my idea any good? Mm. And there's so much fear based on it might not be. And so, you know, bad behavior can come out. Do you ever have that going into like into a role? Like, you know, because you hear so many of the great actors mm. like saying like, you know, the day before they're about to go and do the first day of shooting, they're like, have I just fucked everything up? Am I making the right decisions here? Am I, like, uh, they start questioning themselves in the, mm. in the 12th mm. hour, you know? Absolutely. So I can answer very clearly uh, when I played Kerry Packer, uh, yes. Paper Giants ABC, I was shitting myself for months in the lead up to it. Right. And I was terrified right the way sh through shooting until I heard rap for the last time. And then I got off set and went, okay, that's done. Right. And I still didn't know until I'd seen it whether right. I'd pulled it off. Now, right. uh, as well, we you, know... You, yeah, Logie award-winning performance. Yeah, 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 it went yeah. well for me. Yeah. But I had no idea and I was absolutely terrified and I truly believed at some point, because I was in my early 40s when that happened, when we did that, it was like, uh, people are gonna discover I can't act. Right. Because for the first time ever, I had <laughs> an actual person I was um, r becoming, and people could say, actually, Robbie didn't look like that, and he didn't sound like that. Mm, and so mm. being playing, with those sorts of roles too, it, it, there's a, a multiplicity of challenges in that you've got the character caricature, um, a dichotomy, sort of, which do you do? Do you look and sound like him or do you go for the character? 
So there's that, like how mm. real, because that can so easily fall into parody, mm -hmm. which is really difficult. So you've got the actual, how much do you embody the person and try and be like them? And then you've got all then the basics of being an actor, mm -hmm. which is a whole other conversation, which we don't need to go yeah, into. Sure. But they're, they're different skills. Sure. Um, and so that one, I, I did. I, I absolutely went in f terrified. But. In the same space. So that's a question of can I do it? And the, the larger question, if you're a creator and a writer, which is certainly what stand-ups fall into more, mm -hmm. uh, and what I found with my Willing Participants show is, I've written it. Will they like my idea? Am I going to be funny? Are they going to judge me? Mm. And that can be terrifying. Mm -hmm. So happily with Willing Participant, my solo show, I know the audience like it. Yes. It, it just goes well. Mm -hmm. They're nice stories, right? They're funny stories. They got heart. And they, you've got a story arc and a narrative a begin, engagement. Mate, they've from got the a audience. beginning, middle, yeah. and end. So even if yeah. they don't laugh, they're sitting there absolutely wired to the next word. Yes. And I know that because I've watched it. So that feels good. But then, of course, you've got the slight doubts. What about this audience? What about that audience? We, as performers, we find a million ways to trip ourselves up and make us feel a bit anxious in the mm. lead up to it, mm. right? And then, of course, you've got the added trick of that's basically a 10,000 word monologue I'm delivering. I've written it so that every word's in order. Mm -hmm. And so just the act of learning 10,000 words in a row that I'll get the shits with if I get too out of place, because mm -hmm. I will, mm -hmm. I'll know. I don't want to get, I want to hit every, every word. Every mark, yeah. So it's just that as, as a skill set is difficult to master. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible though. So I discovered in the lead up to, after that, after the regional tour, going way back when, sorry, to pick that story up, did that regional tour, I got one week in, mm -hmm. I was meant to do one more week, mm -hmm. it's amazing tour, the tiniest little towns you've ever seen, you know, some of them weren't even towns, it was just a hall in the middle of a paddock. Yeah, fantastic. Um, in fact, the, one of the early shows, there was a massive brown snake in there, terrifying stuff, <laughs> but quite exciting. Um, so in the lead up to that, that then got shut down um, because of COVID. Right. And so I couldn't do the, the uh, back end of the tour. But what I found with that first week, I was pretty anxious the whole week. Mm. I was running lines so much of the day right. in the lead up to the thing. You're doing a long drive out there, oh, you're going yeah. through it. Lo yeah, or, or, yes. Completely, yeah. completely. Yep. To a degree where it was nerve wracking. Mm. Right? I'm driving around in my car. I'm out in the middle of the sticks. I got an audience. They were small audiences. They hadn't paid, they didn't, hadn't paid to come and see me. Right. So there's a whole lot of the stuff going yes. against me. Now, as it happened, the audience liked the show. Mm -hmm. But coming into, when I remounted the show and thought, no, I can get this on and I want to get it around to people all around Australia and hopefully around the world. I went, I really enjoyed doing the show, but I didn't like having that antsiness in my head for so much of the day. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to address that this time. So I just went through my checklist. I've organised it. No one's forcing me to do it. Mm -hmm. I've written it. I know the audience like it. So where's my concern coming from? If I forget my lines. Well, if I forget my lines, I can have my script over there and I can have a look at it. Mm -hmm. If I do forget my lines, there's no one better placed on the planet to get myself out of it because I'm an improviser, I'm a mm -hmm. debater, I'm mm -hmm. a public speaker, and I'm an MC. Mm -hmm. like, and regarding that, you're not doing Shakespeare, so they don't know the lines. Do they you know? don't know the lines. So you're t you just took it in a different direction. So they've that. got no idea. I right. can get myself out of it. And even if I have a massive mad moment and have to stop and my brain fritzes, mm. Because of my impro background and theatre sports, man, I've died on stage that many times. Yeah. All yeah. I know is that if you are going to die on stage, you go down smiling with a wave and the audience <laughs> fucking love it anyway. Yeah, yeah. They're like, we were there the night that. That was unique. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's the thing that I'll remember. Yeah. yeah. So then I looked at it and went, have I written my stories with love? Yeah. Am I sharing them with... Uh, humility um, and compassion mm -hmm. because there's some stuff in there that speaks to the human spirit and makes people feel less alone. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, some grief resolution stuff, and you know, my fa- passing of my father, mm. uh, and, and I offer these stories up with respect and kindness. Uh, have I worked really hard at remembering my lines? Yeah. In fucking which case, don't fret, dude. Yeah. And so I just told myself that. And in the lead up to these last few shows that I did last year, any time my mind started to go into a, oh, oh, I've got a show coming up and I was feeling a bit nervous, i just go back through that checklist. Have you, have you, have you? Yes, yes, yes. Well, fuck off anxiety. Bring on the audience. Yes. So I've just been practicing great, doing great. it with joy, mate. Yeah. Because as I said before, joy is regenerative. Mm-hmm. Joy brings you back. Joy makes you happy. Joy puts a bounce in your step. And I appreciate the world difficult and there's a lot of problems within it. I truly believe we're going to be best positioned to solve these issues if we still figure out how to do it with joy. Mm-hmm. So true. You know, I just find a lot of people these days trying to fix the world with fucking prissy face and frowny eyes. Yeah, right? I know. And that's <laughs> not bringing anyone into the cause. Mm. You know, uh, it's, yeah. it's like, yeah. If you, if, Shame. Yeah, if, if, if you're the problem and you need to listen to me and you need to, like, who, who's going to go, oh, Amen. Yes. Thanks for you, calling me a fuckwit. Yeah, and, yeah. And I appreciate no being be, being f- feeling guilty for everything that's ever happened <laughs> to anyone in the world. Thank you. Yeah. You know. So, so yeah. So all of these are kind of playing. Out. And then these things are like, uh, these things should be part of your thinking when you're offering up um, shows like we do because sure, it's part sure. of uh, it's part of a kind of a creative dialogue. Uh, but, and at the heart of it is a sense of uh, hope and fear. Yeah. But that trust too that you have when you've done it a few times, that trust in, yeah, this is what I do. I can do this. And, and, and that, it's interesting just when you said before about remembering lines, uh, I thought uh, there was an interview once that I read with um, the great Mark Rylance. Mm. And, and he was saying, he was in a cab and the cab driver was like, well, you know, what do you do for a living? And he goes, I'm an actor. And he's like, oh, Mark, I could never do that. Remembering all those lines. And Mark Rylance was saying, he was thinking, he goes, you know, the problem isn't remembering my lines, it's forgetting my lines. <laughs> yeah, mate. You know, just to, yeah. and which, which then brings around that spontaneity on the night, like which for, for stand-up comics where it's like, oh, you're just discovering it on the night as opposed to reciting a monologue. Yeah, right. Which, which getting back around to that point, you having that background mm. in doing stand-up, mm. I would imagine would be invaluable in doing this sort of show that you're doing. Yeah, I think you so. You know, bringing that spontaneity, bringing that connection because mm. for me stand-up's all about connecting you mm. know with an audience because mm. without that like uh, that's when I had uh, I realized for myself this kind of breakthrough don't chase the laugh connect with the audience you know your material the laugh's going to come as a byproduct of mm. that connection that you have mm. and tenfold as opposed to just going oh I've got to make them laugh you know yeah, it's a, because there's an anxiety in that and there's a, a desperation yeah. in that too you know yeah yeah that's well it's interesting and that sort of um a fulcrum along which th- that balance lies. I was, when I, the first few times I went and watched Story Club, the mm-hmm. show that I was telling you about before, there are a lot of stand up comics doing it. And I was watching, the, so they'd written their story, mm-hmm. and I was watching their story get macheted by their desperation for a laugh. Right. It's like they couldn't hang on to the drama. Mm-hmm. Because they needed the laugh, mm-hmm. and it was like, oh no! If you held, hold, mm-hmm. hold, mm-hmm. hold, release, and then you'll get them. Yes, um, and that's so. Yeah, they, these are the constant things we, we, we're balancing. And but you're absolutely right. I think uh, an audience knows when a performer is uh, needy, mm. and you know, an audience doesn't want to turn up, and they've bought a ticket. They don't want to have to give too much. Yeah, yeah. You know, they want to know they're in, in the good needy hands. space. They want yeah. to laugh and say you're funny, but yeah. they don't really want to sit there and fucking you know and say, oh, we've got you, buddy. You know, you look a bit. It's an interesting yeah. <laughs> thing at the moment in a post Nanette comedy world, mm. right? Um, you know, with Hannah Gadsby's extraordinary um, Nanette, which really kind of you know for a lot of people, but a lot of new people to stand up comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a lot of people, it was like is that stand-up comedy? Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, it can be. Um, but what I found thereafter is that then a lot of the bright young things coming up um, looked at Nanette and thought, gosh, 
that's extraordinary work. It's so beautiful and moving. Um, and she gets these laughs, these rich laughs out of it. It's a very different space. Mm -hmm. What I then noticed for the next number of years, and it still happens at the moment, I still, we're thinking, I still think we're in there, is that a lot of the younger comics are trying to take their trauma and jump it onto stage and think that's enough to be brave to share that, right? Now, the, the difficulty there is that that trauma hasn't been processed and then turned into a creative artistic offering that says to the audience, we can all now laugh about this difficulty thing mm -hmm. I, I went through. Mm -hmm. What we're getting is a kind of an emotional wreckage being inflicted upon us in a desperate hope to accelerate a career through comedy and gravitas, mm -hmm. and they're not quite pulling it off, mm. right? Now, that's not to say they won't, and I always try and look at these things in terms of where those particular comics are on a timeline, mm. uh, and they may be in that space where, okay, they had a crack at that, they didn't quite get the laughs they were wanting or the connection they thought they might or the, the applause for being that brave, mm because it was not a pleasant experience for the audience. It's like, you know, no, you're just inflicting your fucking trauma on us right. and yeah. you haven't wrapped it in a creative offering to make it funny or sad or beautiful. It's yeah. just uh, emotional nerve endings. Right. So I think that's a really interesting area for people to reflect on. Sure, I, I agree. It's like they, they've, they've gone from an audience to a support group. That's it. You know, it's like there's, there's and also too, it's like, uh, just as you're saying that, reminded me when I was starting out doing the open mics and Bill Hicks was very prevalent and you got these comics getting up in an open mic room going, man, I'm over this, I don't need this audience, I don't need you, uh, you, you know, and so, hang on, Bill Hicks had travelled for 20 plus years to bumfuck nowhere doing gigs for apathetic audiences. There's a reason why he had that outlook. Mm. You're a new comic getting up doing a five minute spot at the Bridge Hotel mm. and you're already over it? Yeah. And, you know, and let's be very, very clear, you fucking do need that audience. Yeah. Right, 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 yeah, right, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, man, it's like, yeah, but sure, be influenced by someone, but you've got to understand the context and the whole iceberg that's below the surface. This there. is right. You know, you're just seeing the tip of something here that, you, that you're trying to emulate, but mm. there's a whole backstory here that's behind that's gone this. on which is why hannah was able to navigate that particular topic right which was so hardcore and she navigated it for a very big audience and she was able to offer it up because we were looking at a woman at the top of her game that had been through all of that and was at a point in her life where she was like you know fuck it i'm just going to call it for what it is right now mm. but she had the craft to deliver mm -hmm. um you know and so, uh, yeah, and then as a result, that then had its effect on a lot of the other parts of the industry. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it was a great thing to happen. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. But, but I think, too, we're, we as entertainers or as comedians or actors, or, we, we have an obligation to take the audience somewhere and do something. It's not necessarily about us, it's about them. Mm. And I think with, you know, certain performers um, or maybe younger performers, they're too self-focused on them and what they're experiencing and what the audience needs to know about them as opposed to, no, this is, like I was saying before, this is a connection that we're yeah. having here. Yeah. And it's not all, like, once you get yourself out of the way, mm. that allows you then to open up and really connect with, with, with the crowd. And I, I would think it's the same in, in acting too. Well, like, there's actually, so, so it's a really interesting like for like there. Um, and I think it speaks to mental health mm. in a major, major way with regards to how do you keep going. Mm. So um, a lot of actors and a lot of acting uh, students are all about the method. How am I feeling? Mm. You know, I've mm. got to understand this and I've got to emote and I've got to do this. And there's those classic stories of, um, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis really getting in and just it's about him and how he's feeling in the body. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, the... Dustin Hoffman story in uh, it was in Running Man. We arrived and and, yeah. and the, you know and, and it was it was Olivia. Olivia, yeah. You know why don't you try acting, son? Yeah. <laughs> uh, instead of you know going and running the marathon and all of those sorts of things. So with with when it comes to then acting, and how am I feeling? What am I doing? I, I think that is really. I mean, obviously, we're creatives. We're going to reach into our own experience at some point. We're going to reach into elements of it because it's our emotional framework. It's our chassis through which we experience the world. 
So we're going to have to they're, they're, we're going to have to use it and utilize it to get a connection or an empathy or a compassion or an understanding. That'll be there. Mm -hmm. As an actor, my first port of call when I wake up. Sorry, let's pull back. The job of an actor is to recreate human behaviour in front of a camera or on stage. Mm. Recreate human behaviour. So when I wake up in the morning, my first thought is never, how am I feeling today? Mm. That's not my job. Mm. My job is to recreate human behaviour. Mm. So my job is not to think, how am I feeling? My job is to go, what character am I playing and where do they live? Mm. Where do they exist? How are they feeling? Mm. Mm. Right, so I literally don't start looking inward. I start looking outward, mm -hmm. and so the way I work is it's all about observation, and then curiosity. Mm. Right, so they're doing that and they're saying that they don't quite line up. That's fucking interesting, bit odd. There's a discrepancy between what they're saying, what they're doing, and what they're thinking. Mm. Which is a lot of acting, which is a lot of playwrights or a lot of, you know, writers. Yeah, that's, we're not saying what we're thinking. That's the goal. Saying, yeah, that's it. That's yeah. human behavior. Yeah, that's the that's the matrix. Saying, doing, thinking. There's a mm, gap, mm. right? And all great drama lies in that gap. What then becomes really fascinating, if you want to get into the psychology of it, whether you're a playwright or an actor, is the level to which that person is aware of the size of the gap. Mm. And then that throws mm. you into comedy or drama or, or, or right, wherever right. you're at, sure. right? So yeah, so that notion of waking up, not how am I feeling? I get up and, and go out and look outward, outward, outward. Um, and then you're trying to match various bits of that to, oh, I can see how that might feel like I felt that day. But I never start here. That's the answer to your question. Right. Always starting outwards. Right, right. Which is where the gold is. That's where the gold is, <laughs> generally outside. And it's heaps easier to sustain your own levels of joyous buoyancy. Mm. Um, you, you know, I've been very lucky in my life with mental health in terms of I got touched with an optimistic stick. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've never, uh, I've never had, you know, real difficulties with that. So I appreciate that's and, not everyone's. And was that your just nature, was that just your natural nature or was that your upbringing or a bit I was, of both? I was or? brought up by beautiful, loving parents in a loving home. So yeah. again, I don't take any of that for granted. Um, I've been naturally, um, I've got a lot of energy anyway. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah, this is kind of the way it's played. And then as you go through life, you try and figure out ways to, um, I guess, sustain those good feelings while interrogating right because I, I am endlessly curious so it's mm, not like I, mm. it's not like I'm just letting shit go under the bridge and not examining it sure. like, you know I'm trying to get in there but that's such an important thing I think especially as a creative person is that curiosity you mm. know that we have when we were kids and not losing that as we get older and especially in acting too you know to be curious about the world out there and about characters and about other people that's you know uh, that's where that's where it's all at. That's it. So when my boys just before my boys were born, and you know we we have hopes for our our children, right? Um, and I remember hoping that they'd be born with two characters. You know, you think, oh gosh, if I could, if I could order mm. two characteristics, <laughs> mm. um, and they were curiosity and optimism. Mm. These two things, if you can remain curious and optimistic, mm. then you never stop. Mm -hmm. uh, and happily, I was blessed with curious and optimistic boys. Yeah, uh, and I do think that's the driver. Um, and for ongoing reinvention too. Mm. You know, the optimism is critical because you want to wake up each morning and think, fucking, well, yeah, what, what next? Yeah, sure, sure. And the curiosity is um, an essential driver because it obviously leads you into two areas um, constantly, which is new areas and a constant picking at the fabric of what's presented anyway. Mm -hmm. you know, so you're not taking anything for granted. You're not being. You're not just buying the lie. Yes. You joyously just looking under the covers and going, is that right, mate? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. That's what you're saying, but this uh, is the actuality here. 
Well, someone that does that um, tenfold is the musician that you chose for your favorite album. Oh, uh, yeah. Who's able to take what, you know, what the government says, what society says and go, mm, actually, flip it on its head and look at it from a different angle and call it out. Yeah. It's Billy Bragg. That's right. And his album, which is Workers' Playtime. Yeah, that's right. So I chose uh, Billy Bragg and Workers' Playtime largely because... It captured a time in my life that I reflect on with great joy. Mm. And that's those sort of the last teenage years. I was mm -hmm. 18, 19 years old when I started listening to Billy Bragg and I saw him live down at Selena's nightclub. Oh, uh, Selena's was this back in the 80s? Uh, yeah, yeah, late 80s. So yeah. Workers' Playtime, I think, came out 88. 88. Yeah. I think he toured here 89, maybe. Oh, so he toured that album. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, and so it was just listening to a guy, I mean, his, the, his music's beautiful and it's, you know, it's, but again, he was a man's man expressing emotions, a lot of love stories mm. uh, in there, but also getting, getting into that notion of uh, manhood, of the role that the masculine plays in society, mm. um, detrimental to itself as well as, you know, detrimental to, you know, others in, in the wrong forms as well. Um, I thought he was compassionate mm -hmm. to the masculine experience while being uh, critical of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and also and I, very vulnerable too. Utterly vulnerable. You know, that, that, that track, um, The Price I Pay. Price I Pay for Loving You. Yeah. It's, uh, he's just, yeah, but like any great artist does, he lays it out there and, uh, but does it in a, in a, very, it's, it's not a woe is me yeah. kind of sentiment. It's more of just like, yeah, I, I, I know that I'm on a losing train here, but I'm, I'm, I'm not getting Absolutely. off. Absolutely. What are the lines? My friend said she could see no ahead. I would probably be better off without you, but I'm sorry to say I turned her away. Knowing everything she said was true. Right. That's the price yes. I pay for loving you. Um, and there's so much of his stuff that, yes, yeah, speaks to. And I guess too. So I, I grew up on the northern beaches of Sydney, right? Mm -hmm. A little surfing community. It was. It was. Um, it was a bit rough and tough back in the day. Mm -hmm. Pittwater High School was a pretty rough high school. Um, Which high school was it? Pit, Pittwater oh, High School. Pittwater High, yeah. Um, back in the day, it was pretty rough around the edges, sort of, um, and there wasn't a huge amount of dialogue around what was actually going on for people, mm. you know, and then, so, you know, looking back on those years, those high school years, it's so heartbreaking, isn't it? You think of the kid that was the bully that was frightening everyone and, and brought so much terror to, to those of us that, were, you know, that he was going to bash up. And then now, with an adult side looking back, you think of that poor bully. What was happening at home? Oh, dude. Mm. Terrifying. Mm. Right? And so I kind of knew, I was already acting at this age. So I was having, I just started acting when I was 14. So I was having conversations off the ball and at work about these things that rippled through it. But what I loved about Billy Bragg was a masculinity with the tender vulnerability, mm. speaking to notions of love and hope and wonder and loss, mm. um, but doing it in a way that, allowed a man to be a man and to include all of that stuff. Mm. Um, and then recently um, I was at a, um, a friend's 50th and I caught up with an old friend from Australian Theatre for Young People that I went to when I was 17. Her name's Catherine, an incredible woman, super interesting. Um, and she said to me, Rob, um, you've got no idea how much you changed my life and this isn't a brag because I didn't change a life. Billy Bragg changed a life. It was that. <laughs> yeah, and I said, no. what's that? And she said, well, you were listening to Billy Bragg back then. I was like, oh, yeah, I was. I, I loved Billy Bragg. Yeah. And she's like, well, you just set me down a path. And I became Billy addicted for three years. So we started going back through that and those conversations. And it just reminded me of what people like Billy Bragg bring to the table for young people 
where our emotions are such a soup and a sea. We've got so much hope for the mm, world. Mm. We've got no idea as to all the things that are going to come. And these artists write these songs that speak to us and for us. Mm. And so until we can find our own voice and our own words and our own structures, we can sit with them for a little while. Yeah, we and have feel this that, guide. Feel that we're not alone. Yeah, yeah, it's true. The, this is your talking then about the themes that you got from that with in terms of masculinity masculinity and that reminded me of a book that I read uh, just as I was leaving school called Manhood by Steve Biddle sure and in, and in that where he's talking because these days like the word masculinity is, is seen as a negative or it's you know in in, in a lot of uh, in a lot of press you know mm. it's always seen as oh you, you know, male toxic masculinity and what have you and that that book, for for me, just made it, made us realize the importance of what it is to be masculine. Yeah. Not being a, an alpha dominating, you know, force of nature who's going to you know destroy anything in its path. It's it's, it's so far beyond that. So much so much more elevated than mm. that. And the importance of that dynamic in relationships and in not only like female-male um, relationships, but male-male relationships as well. And yeah, it's just a very, uh, that, that book was, uh, I found, just a, a great guide. That's right, and, 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 and a positive observation on it. So you said before that at the moment, that masculinity, at the moment in the current public discourse, it's coupled with the word toxic, mm. right? toxic masculinity. Um, and that's a desperate shame. Because, and, and I use the word shame specifically because there's a lot of shame associated with the male, um, the, the male energy mm. uh, or the patriarchy uh, and all of those sorts of things. And at the moment, I think that's not helpful because, again, um, I don't want to be ashamed of being masculine. Mm -hmm. I want to be proud. And Steve Bidoff talks about that. You know, how do we do that? Now, there is, of course, a huge amount um, that is toxic um, in this debate. And, but the, the issue is when the public discourse becomes so um, binary mm. uh, in that space, then it beca masculinity becomes a, a, a bad word in and of itself. Now, you can see the same thing, the exact same thing happening with the word woke at the moment. Mm. Woke is becoming a dirty word. Mm. Um, it's becoming a pejorative. It's becoming, you know, it's sort of, at first it was like, oh, okay. And now people are using it just to dismiss tranches of um, arguments mm -hmm. and ideas and thoughts. Woke, woke, oh, the bloody woke. Now, there's a huge amount about woke that's really important mm -hmm. and so crucial that we start addressing. Um, and yet it's people that are they're lumping everything into everything, this because yeah, there's yeah. elements of the woke movement, like any movement, where to my eye it's blisteringly mad. Mm -hmm. Um, and sure. it needs to be poked at and said, well, that part's blisteringly mad. But the other part of being woke, if being woke is also taking a breath and trying to get a sense of another person's perspective. Empathy, yeah. Then fucking bring it on. Mm. It's the same with political correctness, you know. Yep. Like, at its core, political correctness of, you know, thinking of others' feelings, be, thinking before you're saying something that may affect someone else. Yeah, at its core... Who wouldn't like? Who wouldn't agree with that? Like having some respect and understanding for someone else mm. before opening your mouth. But then the wild extremities that it goes to. It's like, oh man, but how are we going to have a conversation, a natural conversation here, without offending someone? Or yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it becomes ridiculous. Mm, mm. But it's same in politics these days mm. too. You know, mm. like you have conservative, then you have far right, and then you have um, you know like liberal, but then you have far left mm. it's like where's this middle ground that we need to kind of you know focus on getting stuff done and i know that your your dad was in politics yes, and, he was. and it's it's that middle ground of both sides hey what about working together and finding out something to to for the betterment of everyone mm. as opposed to the betterment of a select few or to keep everyone happy behind you. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I think a... it's, um, and again, that we get into, and that starts to match up into that notion of my feelings come first. We were talking about young comics earlier on, post mm. the, um, Nanette, which is my feelings are the most important thing here. And it's like, well, that's mm. going to get in between you and a good audience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's uh, at the moment, these various 
dialogues that we've brought up, whether it's the woke movement, masculinity, the political uh, environment, uh, at the moment, it, it's like a race to be offended, right? Yeah. I'm racing to be offended. Right. And, and so the game I like to play, and again, it's just an intellectual exercise, but it's super fun to do, mm. which is be sitting there and rather than a race to take offence mm. and a race to, let, to indicate to everyone else that you've taken offence, right, to indicate where your colours lie. And we can get back to that because I think all of that um, value indication is the antithesis of artistry. Mm. Um, I believe it's, uh, it's really important for artists to withhold their positioning as long as possible mm. because then you can start experiencing the various different positions um, and you get more real observations from other people. If they don't know what you're thinking, they're going to double down. They're going to give you more. Sure, Whereas if you sure. start indicating which way you're going to go, you're not going to get the true them. Yeah. And then it's very difficult to get a sense of what they're doing and then you can't recreate that behaviour as cleanly. Right. So I think it's really important in actual fact, rather than to go, yeah, I'm an artist, this is what I believe, to I'm just going to be present for a while yeah. and it serve my purposes for you not to know. Mm. Now, I might write a play, do a bit, and at the end of it, you may become apparent where I'm kind of standing. Mm. But for the most part, I prefer to sit in a liminal space and listen. And listen. Mm. Um, now that slight sidebar just jogged me out of a, a, a run I was at before, but it was about that notion of feelings first, racing to outrage. Mm. So what I try and do, this is this is the, the hypothetical I try and put myself through, or the intellectual game I play, is when sitting with anybody, I like to play the game, no matter how fucking outrageous what they're saying is. Can I imagine a set of circumstances where I might agree? Mm. Mm. Now, sometimes you've got to do some serious... Because it's really easy to take offence. Someone says that, and from a distance, you're like, fuck you, dude. Yeah. Right? But then you go, all right. Here's an easy one. Easy one. This is an easy one. Easy place to start to give an actual example of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm against the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Are you, mate? <laughs> Because I'm imagining a few scenarios where you'd kill someone. Yeah. Right? Mm. That's an easy, easy example. I fucking would never murder anyone, really. Mm -hmm. I would. Because mm -hmm. I've done the hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. And I can... No, I'd prefer not to. And I'd do a million things. But I can also imagine a scenario where I would. Mm -hmm. So let's fucking check the judgment at the door, please, until mm. we go through them all. Mm -hmm. So that's just something I've got. I've been doing lately, as you say, the you know the, the positions are becoming so extreme, and the middle ground is is absent. Mm. To stay comfortable in a liminal space, I play the game of, in what circumstance might I do that? Sure, sure. You know, that's great, mate. And, and I think it is something that needs to be discussed more. You know, mm. more openly. Look, it's, they're uncomfortable things, I know, for people to discuss, but they still need, you know, if there are going to be good changes and uh, positive changes, it does need to be addressed and, uh, yeah. and more openly discussed. Mm. Yeah. And that's why on Look, Listen, Laugh, we're, uh, <laughs> we are the forum to do that. <laughs> now, I have, um, I have each guest always bring along their favourite album, mm. um, film and book. Now, before we get to the book, your favourite film, mm. which Academy Award winning classic, mm. and that is none other than The Sting. Look at that. <laughs> look at that. Look at um, that. Redford and Newman right on the yeah, cover there. Yeah, that's right. And look at this. You've got the masterpiece collect. It looks beautiful, mate. Yeah, The Sting. I mean, it's got the wonderful music, the entertainer. and um, mm -hmm. But again, to me, there's a couple of things. So I first saw this. This was the first movie I saw that I remember being truly taken into another world. Mm. It was aspirational, you know, it's that, um, you know, playing a prank um, on people. Um, had Robert Redford, so charismatic. His name was Robert. My name was Robert. I wanted to be an actor. He was an actor, of course. Both blonde played. hair. You, you tell you, it's amazing what you tell yourself <laughs> as a kid. Um, and... What I remember about the spoiler alert about the film was that moment where 
I thought Redford's character had um, done the dirty on Newman. Mm, that classic ending, yes. With the double play on it. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was heartbroken. I was fucking heartbroken. It was like he was your mate. Mm. And so that notion of mateship and these underdogs fucking hacking at the fuckwit. Mm. So it really tapped into my, my sense of, like I was in trouble a lot at high school. Um, not bad, not bad, just lippy. And it, like, cause I couldn't. Talking back. Talking and, back yeah. and all of those things. And, and I, cause I loved, I loved ideas. I wasn't afraid of, of, of cross-checking stuff, but it, mm. it, 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 it gets you into trouble. And that notion of speaking truth to power is something that's always been um, important to me. I think you mentioned my father before who was a politician, then went on to head up the Red Cross and do extraordinary work all around the world. Um, you know, my dad was quite literally a nation shaper. Mm. Um, and yet he grew up on the banks of the uh, Sylvania River there. Um, first person in his family to go anywhere near university. I think he was, you know, no one really finished high school. He was dirt poor, uh, had a brain the size of a planet and remembered his upbringing. Uh, and, and just ploughed through life with this wonderful twinkle in his eye, a, a beautiful sense of, of hope, but extraordinarily powerful in his capacity to sit in the face of the dominant paradigm and ask why. Mm, mm. Why? Why should it be like this when it could be better? Yeah. Right? And so that sense of that. So anyway, we a young kid watching the sting. It was like Lonigan, Lonigan, Lennerman. Um, <laughs> and they fucked him over and yeah. they got him. Mm. So I loved that. And mm. then, and their mate, so they had the African-American character in there. When he got killed, I was devastated, right. devastated. And, then, yeah. and so again, as a young, you're not looking at color or this. It was just, they were mates. Yes. And they took out their mate and then with the double cross and then the final tag on it. So I kind of had all of those things, which was speaking up against um, authority. Yeah. Power mateship. figures. Yeah. yeah, power figures. Mateship, daring do, mm -hmm. bit of bullshit, yeah. fucking trusting your gut, exquisite planning. Yes. All the things you need to do to make a good show. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Tick all the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, and it was when, when you um, talk about their mate in the alleyway when he falls down. And I'm looking at him thinking, this guy's familiar. And then when I looked at the credits at the end of the film and going, yeah, that's um, James Earl Jones' dad. Yeah. You know, just having that. <laughs> and also George Roy Hill, like watching it. You know, wow, this, this directing seems very, it's, a, it's, a, a very, it's very stylized. Yeah. And then thinking, oh, of course, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You know? Absolutely. And then you think, oh, those. Newman. Uh, you see the connection between mm. um, Newman and um, Redford. And, oh, yeah, they, of course they're already work bouncing off each other so well. They've already worked together on this, mm. these other films with this same director. So every, it, it, there was an ease to the film too. Like it didn't, it, it just felt, there was, although it was kind of stylized, it felt mm. very authentic in, mm. In, mm. In, in that regard that everyone seemed to gel. That's know? right. And they did it again and again and again. Again, right, so they had that repeat business, which is again getting back to the notion of injecting joy mm. into your work. The reason joy is so important is because it allows people to work together again, mm. right? And when we work together again, we learn. Mm. You know, so often I hear, "I'll be all right." You know, if I get the job done, water under the bridge. Well, it's not water under the bridge. Mm. Human beings remember everything, sure. and we don't hang out with fuckwits. Yeah. Right. So if you're not bringing joy to your projects, then you're not able to do it again, and then you're not going to learn, mm. or you're not going to be able to take all of that stuff and build and build and build like kaizen. You know, mm. sort of incremental, incremental betterment. Yeah. Well, here, as you said that before, uh, I thought of it. Now that you brought it up again, I'll say it. There's an interview years ago with George Clooney, and he basically said the exact same thing. He said that he wants on a film set that he's directing, he wants there to be a joy on that film set. And for everyone to get along, he says, there's these directors, and he goes, and I've worked for him, where he said, where, you know, they think that the tension, that's where you get the creativity out of. And he goes, no, nah, that's bullshit. I don't, don't need that um, animosity. I on the agree set. with him. Yeah. yeah, I agree, mate. There's enough tension in trying to get it right. Right? There's so many variables. That, the fact that a film even gets made mm. is miraculous, mm. you know? Mm. So adding ego and all this extra, you know, unneeded, you know, drama onto it, it's, nah. 
kill him. So, yeah, it's like this, it should be. Well, it is. It's a communal effort too. So if there's someone that's causing trouble within that, then mm. you know the whole thing just becomes a laborious task. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think sometimes we confuse um, uh, intellectual interrogation with with uh, fighting. There's a lot of people. If you disagree with my idea, you think I'm a fuckwit. Mm. Um, whereas I got brought up in a house of debate. Healthy debate. Yeah, yes. and to me, he, 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 agreeing or disagreeing with your idea is my love language. Mm. Right? If you've said something and I'm interrogating it, it might make you feel shit while I'm doing it, but trust me, I'm doing it because I admire you mm -hmm. and I want, to, I want to see if we can fine-tune this idea. Mm. Uh, and so that's a really important skill, I think, for creative artists to practice is you know, how do you have these robust discussions without it degenerating into that stuff I was talking about before where your fear starts hijacking mm. your tongue uh, and you start getting angry with people that are trying to help you. Yeah. Well, I think across the world that's needed. Mm. Like just in general day-to-day -day communication, healthy debate, it seems like something that's, uh, you know, a bygone yeah. uh, value or a bygone uh, attribute. Yeah. You know, it's, like, yeah. it's like, you don't agree with what I do, you're the problem. You know, that's it. All right, well, discussion's over, man. Yeah. You know? It's like, there's a, what else is there to be said now? You've clearly made up your mind. Mm. Whatever I say doesn't matter mm. because it doesn't, you know, resonate with your agenda or your, you know, mm. your thought process. So what, what's the, there's no room for it. Yeah, yeah, to, to keep that. going. The difficulty is going to be addressing that because the modern world is set up for each of us to walk away and not need that person again. Mm. Mm. Right? I don't need you, that's fine, I'll go and I can buy my food for, I don't need you. So, you know, historically the human being evolved to be living in tribes where we couldn't just walk away. We'd have to get through it because we're going hunting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. right? So how are we going to figure this out? We've got to figure this shit out. Mm. But the modern world is um, less set up for that. It's uh, much more set up to, yeah, you're a bit of a fuckwit, mate, I'm, I'm, you're done. Yeah, and then the less practice we have at getting through that first bit, this is why manners are so important, mm -hmm. right? Because the manners allow us for the first, you know, few minutes just to fucking put a couple of things in place, but we don't need to commit to anything. We don't need to. But I'm just going to say the nice, right things, so that we get through that first bit of, you know, do we kill each other? Sure. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully we get, hopefully we can fit, build a. a better foundations than just manners. You sure, know, sure. Shared ideals and things But that's like that. where it's got to start. There's got to be a mutual respect, you yeah. know, in order to make any change. I think so. And, yeah, it just feels that this... Uh, God, no, everyone's so concerned with being right. Yeah. You know, it's like, we're not always right. Yeah. We're not, you know, and, and if I am wrong, show me, tell me. Yeah. You know, mm, mm. it's like, yeah, this whole idea of everyone needing to feel that they're, you know, I, I got you. Yeah. I got that over you. I, I got a mate that's got an interesting twist on that, right? And he gets accused of wanting to be right all the time. And his response is a good one. He says, no, no, I don't want to be right. I just don't want to be wrong. Mm. I don't have to be right. You can be right. Yeah, yeah. Just so long as I know you're right, then I won't be wrong. Right. Right? right. It's like, why are you chasing this? You've got to be right. It's like, no, no, I just think we're both wrong at the moment. Mm. And I don't want that. Mm. Or... I might be a bit right and a bit wrong. I just don't want to be any kind of wrong. Mm. So I'm just going to check. So he annoys people, mm. but they think it's because he wants to be right. right. He doesn't give a shit where the information comes from or whose it was. He's just interested in getting to the right answer. Mm -hmm. And it's a really important distinction to make. Sure, sure. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm always right. <laughs> or taking that time out, like you said, and, mm. and, and thinking about it in the back of the mind, coming back the next day and going, look, you know, I was probably out of line there. Right yeah, I was out. probably out of line too. Mm. But hang on, what about this other solution? Mm. That would be a nice way to approach it. Uh... Yeah, right. <laughs> In a perfect world. Right. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're getting around to your third favourite. Yeah. Which is, um, you got a lot of, lot of attention at the moment. Yeah, this is the book of the world at the moment. This is which the is Trent Dalton's. Yeah, Trent Dalton's Boy Swallows Universe. It is the uh, obviously extraordinary Australian uh, novel, uh, Trent Dalton's debut novel when it came out a number of years ago, sold millions around the world. Uh, and then the reason it's so hot uh, right now, jumped straight back into the top 10 the other day, is because of Netflix Boy Swallows Universe, the adaptation yep. you know, on the TV. Yeah. Featuring none other than yeah, I Mr. play. Rob I, yeah, I'm really proud of the role I play in that. I play um, the editor of the Courier Mail, Brian Robertson. Yes. Um, and there's of course an extraordinary cast in that, and they've you know it's, it's been going gangbusters around the world. 
Um, yeah, you know, I've got friends in America who, who are mentioning it. Like yeah, saying, I just binged this whole thing. Yeah. It was great. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think last time I looked, it was in the top five right. in the States. Um, which is a great effort. Yeah. And uh, look, it's an extraordinary book. Um, it's Ultimately, as Trent says, this book is about love. Mm. It's about a family that desperately loves each other. Mm -hmm. um, they desperately love each other and they're just at different times in their life where they're un unable to help each other when we first meet them. Mm. And they've mm. got to go through a hell of a lot um, to... Become a family again, mm. um, but at the heart of it, it is pulsing with love. And again, the lead character Eli Bell is curiosity mm -hmm. um, personified. He just won't stop. Mm -hmm. And it's you know, and it's it's kind of it's 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 a strange mix of realism, of magic realism, um, you know, just old uh, suburban wonder tales. Daring do, there's you know, there's mystery, there's drama, there's romance, there's a lot of really interesting um, observations on masculinity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all sorts of different masculine characters. And to that end, the character I play, Brian Robertson, uh, sits into that um, part of the conversation really nicely as well. The th my experience, there's so much to talk about this particular book. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I tell you a fun story that brings the book and this will give you a sense of Trent Dalton and the experience of filming it as well and, and, and we'll see how we go. Okay, great. I want to hear this. Okay, so we've, when I first read Boy Swallows Universe, I was just so blown away by it and I, and I love, love my books. So I've always been a big reader. So that was back in the day. I sent him a fanboy message on Twitter, right, just to... Didn't know if he'd ever get it. Uh, I'd been on telly at the time, so there was a bit of my work was around, so he mm -hmm. kind of knew of me. Mm -hmm. I get this response back. And he was like, excited to hear from me. I'm like, excited to hear from me? Oh my God. <laughs> I was like, so we got to know each other a bit back then, uh, just through a kindness and a mutual respect, I guess. Then when I got cast as Brian Robertson, I got a message again through social media from Trent saying, hey, just saw you've been cast. I can't tell you how happy I am in said a couple of nice things. So I called him up and said, mate, he said, I said, I'm really, he says, Brian Robertson is one of my favorite characters in the book because Trent dug himself out of that difficult space by becoming a journalist. Mm -hmm. So his lifeblood is the newspaper room, right? And so he had all these mentors, male mentors, um, you know, wild, rangy, different sorts of men that had good and bad in them. And Brian Robertson was amalgam of all of these characters. And mm. so he put a lot of his own observations and a lot of stuff into this particular character. And I knew that. So knowing that, um, I knew that, that this particular character was important to him, as every character in the book is, but, you know, with his particular life. So I went back, reread the book, looked at all the Brian Robertson stuff, and I made sure that my cardigans and all my clothes and things like that were kind of true to what Trent's observations were, because I'm honouring his initial observations as a gifted artist, mm -hmm. right? It's like, well, we're going to start there, and if it doesn't work for the TV because it's a translation, then we'll make the change. But always start with Trent and mm -hmm. his observations because they come from a lived place. Sure. And as you know, with my acting experience, it's about getting out and where do they come. Like, always start with the external. So then I then have now the lucky opportunity as we're filming to be able to ring Trent, right? And say, hey buddy. So we've got these scenes coming up and I'm driving along, I'm thinking about it, it's the next day and I'm, you know, and my mind's, brain's working all the time, all, all hours. I'm driving, I think, oh man, what's the fucking temperature check in the room at the, you know, at their particular scene, but a big thing coming up mm. and the editor's about to make a big speech. I want to know how to pitch it. You know, is he just cool? Is it fucking stressful? What's going on? So I ring Trent. I say, look, this scene, back end of the series, back end of the book, you know, it's a Friday afternoon, putting the Saturday paper to bed, everything's turning pear-shaped. I say, what's the vibe in the place? And he tells me this. He says, Robbie, Friday afternoons before the Saturday paper. He says, you've got no idea. And in a situation like Brian Robertson was facing, these stakes are really high. He says he's got you know a couple of stories missing. He doesn't know where the um, 
uh, where the journalists are. He says, the stakes are super high. Rob, I can't put too fine a point on it. It is big, it is rowdy. I really want you to think about Gandalf at the foot of Mordor making a speech, taking back that fucking place, right? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> that's it, <laughs> right? So then I get buzzed up and I get, I get excited when I hear this because the guy's a freak. He's an extraordinary talent. And just the passion with which he imparted that story. And stories, mm. uh, you, you know, stories are, are viruses. They enter your body and they change your being and they change you physiologically and they change the environment you're in. So I'm like, right. So we then, but I'm the only one holding this story. But myself, a couple of other actors, and about 30 extras, right? So non speaking actors uh, on set the next day. And we've all got to create this thing that he was, t that only I knew about. Mm. So then, with um, the generosity of the director, I said to the director, I said, look, we're about to shoot this thing. And I, and I had a plan for this thing that I had to pitch to the director as well, it was how I was going to do the scene. Um, and I had to pitch to him and I said, but mate, do you mind, can I have the room for a moment? Because there's all these actors and extras and, and, and I'm their boss in the, in the, the thing and I kind of want to set the, and he said, no one at all. So I gather everyone around and I go, all right, friends, come in. I was on the phone to Trent Dalton last night and they're like, because they've all read the fucking book, right? Everyone's into Trent and Trent's like, you know, they go. <laughs> so I say, okay, here's, what it, here's what's happening. Right, when this phone call comes, when I come out, when this scene starts, we're at 4.45. Uh, we meant to have the thing to bed, right? I said, this is what he told me. I said, so these are the stakes. You get everyone in, you tell them the story, and they're like, right, right, we're ready to go. And, and by this stage, we'd been in that venue for a couple of weeks. Right. Everyone, the whole place was built. So we were surrounded by the uh, sort of late 70s, early 80s gear in those new room, newsrooms. So mm -hmm. the whole thing felt real. We are all in the outfits. It was just this final piece of the puzzle bringing Trent's story and giving it voice in that space and watching it affect everyone. So I finished that story, they're like, right. So we go, we ready to go? Right, you fuckers, let's get to work. And then we shoot the scene. So it's that kind of fun thing where it's a real gift in our world to be able to recreate that interesting time and place mm. through stories, through time. And that little moment where Trent speaks to me and I can speak to others, others can listen, the director is then affected by it and all of a sudden through curiosity and optimism and wonder and bravery of sharing and generosity of sharing, you can create something new and dynamic and vibrant. Mm. And so my hope is over the course of the next 30 years as I step into this solo show space, this collaborative space with theatre makers, with live audiences. This is ultimately what I'm trying to bring to my craft and to my work. Joy, optimism, curiosity, wonder, so that we can share our stories and make the whole world feel less alone. Mm. Well, you've certainly brought that today, my friend. Oh, cheers, my man. <laughs> and I, 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 honestly, I can't, cannot wait to see your, your one-man show. It's, uh, you know, uh, to, to see everything, to see what you've learned and what you've become over the years put into the context of a one-man show, brilliant. Cheers, mate. Can't wait, buddy. Thanks, mate. Great chatting with you, bro. Love it. to chat to you, Charles, Thanks for coming always, along. mate. You're one of the true gentlemen of our industry. Oh, thank you, mate. Likewise. Cheers.